So let's continue. We've discussed administration. Now let's move on and discuss absorption. So this is the picture you've seen before. And we are going to talk about this process here. How does the drug get from the site of administration to reaching the systemic circulation? So the definition of absorption is the transfer of a drug from the site of administration to the systemic circulation. Please note that it's not the transfer of the drug from the site of administration to the site of action. So it defined as the transfer of a drug from the site of administration to the systemic circulation. For IV administration, absorption is complete. What does this sentence mean? Well, simply stated, it means that 100% of a drug administered into the vein is already in the circulation because the blood is circulating through the vein. And for this reason, we say 100% of a drug administered intravenously is available. We also use the term bioavailability. So for IV administered drugs, the bioavailability is 100%. For all other rights of administration, absorption is variable. And thus, bioavailability is also variable, but it is always less than 100%. So our reference point is IV administration. So let's go back to this picture that we've seen before and talk about it within the context of absorption. So the vast majority of drugs that we use in clinical medicine today, we give by mouth. They're pills, they're capsules, they're tablets. So you can see from this picture that if you give a drug by mouth, it goes through this previously described very complicated path before it actually gets absorbed into the drug stream, into the bloodstream, excuse me. And this concept of bioavailability refers to how much of drug X administered actually gets delivered to the systemic circulation. What percentage of the drug administered is actually absorbed to the point that it gets into the circulation. So there are many things that are going to interfere with this process, are going to determine this process. And here we are referring to GI, absorption of drugs, so orally administered medication. First of all, it's going to depend on blood supply. So let's just go back and look at the blood supply. We're looking at this here. What is the blood supply to the gut that permits the absorption of the drug from the lumen of the GI tract into the liver? So that's point number one. What is the blood supply to the intestine uh, versus other parts of, of the GI tract? And typically we say the intestine, the small intestine specifically, has a more dense blood supply than the stomach. And in reality, more drugs are absorbed from the intestine than are absorbed from the stomach. The second thing that will influence how much of the drug you gave will be absorbed is the presence of food in the stomach. Generally speaking, we say that food delays absorption. I'm sure many of you have picked up a script from the pharmacy and the instructions on that prescription have said, take on an empty stomach. And the reason for this recommendation is because food can significantly reduce the absorption of some medications. A very good example of this is the drug for osteoporosis called Fosamax, where food in the stomach dramatically reduces the amount of that drug that is absorbed and available for action. A third concept is the presence of other medications in the stomach. Now, why should this be important? Well, two reasons. One is two medications could actually compete for the same carrier mechanism that is required to bring the drug from the lumen of the stomach across the endothelial cell lining the GI tract and into the portal vein. So specific carrier mechanisms can be competed for. And you're going to have medications that may have higher affinity, attraction, for the carrier than another medication. 
So this can introduce another variable element. Another concept is that a drug may actually bind another drug and prevent absorption. A good example of this from clinical medicine today is a drug called cholestyramine and another drug called colesavalam. These are two medications that are used to treat high cholesterol and they work by binding cholesterol within the GI tract. They actually bind bile salts. But they have the ability to bind other medications. One example being drugs used for immunosuppression. So let's, for example, think of a patient who might have a heart transplant. That patient may also have high cholesterol. For the heart transplant, the patient will be taking daily immunosuppressive medication. For the high cholesterol, the patient may be taking a drug such as colesavalam to reduce the high cholesterol. You have to be very careful to time the appropriate time at which you take these medications so that the colesavalam wouldn't bind the immunosuppressive drug and prevent, it being, uh, prevent the immunosuppressive drug from being absorbed. So keep those two concepts in mind. Meds may compete for carrier mechanisms or one medication may bind another medication and prevent its absorption. A fourth concept is how much metabolism breakdown of a drug occurs in those cells that line the GI tract. These are referred to as enterocytes or GI endothelial cells. So metabolism within the enterocyte can result in reducing the amount of drug that actually ends up being absorbed into the portal cir circulation or the portal vein. So the degree of metabolism in the enterocyte is going to predict or predicate or determine the amount of drug that actually gets from the GI tract into the systemic circulation. A fourth concept is the state of the patient. So some patients who have chronic disease states, such as poor blood circulation, chronic renal failure, chronic heart failure, these in many situations can be considered to be hypovolemic states. In these situations, blood supply may be an issue. And remember we said previously that blood supply is important to the GI tract. Another large category is prior GI surgeries. Now, I mention this one specifically because we live in an era of ever-increasing numbers of patients with obesity. Bariatric surgical procedures as a surgical approach to treat obesity is becoming more common. Many of these bariatric surgeries have the potential to significantly reduce the GI surface area for absorption. At this time, we don't have a good understanding of how bariatric surgical procedures affect the absorption of drugs. So it is something that we need to keep in mind. The next two concepts we're going to talk about in some detail because they need further explanation. The first of these is permeation principles. The second is the level of acidity or the pH within the GI tract. So let's first of all talk about permeation principles. What does permeation mean? Permeation is the concept of a molecule moving from point A through point B and typically involves crossing over some sort of membrane or barrier. So there are several principles that govern permeation, the ability to move from point A to point B. The first of these is commonly referred to as Fick's Law. This is the concept of passive diffusion, that molecules will move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. And that movement will continue to occur until such time as there is an equilibrium in existence on both sides of the membrane. We refer to this in pharmacology as aqueous diffusion. The second concept is lipid diffusion. And this is the idea that a drug can move through a lipid membrane. There is a 
cardinal principle that governs how this occurs and the rate at which it occurs. And this is referred to as Henderson-Hasselbach's equation or Henderson-Hasselbach principles. The third is that there may be a specific carrier mechanism. We mentioned this previously in regards to carrier mechanisms for taking drugs across the GI tract. And then finally is the idea of endocytosis and exocytosis. And the best way for me to explain this is actually to show you a picture. So let's look at these four mechanisms. First of all, aqueous diffusion. So this is fixed law. So you have a molecule that is at high concentration on one side of the membrane and a relatively low concentration on the other side of the membrane. The molecule will pass through what's shown here as an aqueous channel in example number A. The molecules will continue to travel through this aqueous channel until an equilibrium is reached. Example B is lipid diffusion. And here we see a molecule on one side of the membrane actually passing through the membrane, passing through what is referred to as the lipid bilayer. In order for this to happen, the molecule must be lipid soluble. It must have the capacity to move with reasonable freedom across the lipid bilayer of the cell membrane. The third example shows specific carrier mechanisms. These exist in predetermined quantities. So for drugs that are dependent upon specific carrier mechanisms, there is only a definitive amount of drug that will be able to reach the systemic circulation depending on the availability of the carrier mechanism involved. In relation to carrier mechanisms, you can see that movement can occur in a bi-directional way. It can go, for example, from the lumen of the GI tract, saying that that is here, into the portal circulation here, or vice versa. And then we mentioned endocytosis and exocytosis. So here, for example, say this is the GI lumen. We have a molecule which is endocytosed from the lumen of the GI tract into the cell membrane itself. It's delivered to the external membrane and it's exocytosed on the other side. This is actually a pretty rare phenomenon for the vast majority of drugs that we look, that we use in clinical medicine today. So passive diffusion. Concentration gradient exists across the cell membrane. The rate of flow increases linearly with the concentration. The higher the concentration on one side, the faster the flow to the lower concentration side. It's not saturable. This is an important concept. So water-soluble drugs that penetrate cell membranes through aqueous channels are going to depend on passive diffusion for the most part. If you increase the size of the molecule, the aqueous channel will be too small to allow transport. So you need the molecule to be small and you need the molecule to be water soluble for passive diffusion to occur. Lipid soluble molecules pass through membranes. Size is less of an issue. However, if the molecule is charged, for example, protonated, it can slow down the transport. Lipid diffusion in further detail. Many drugs that we use in clinical medicine today are either weak acids or weak bases. This changes how drugs are absorbed. The electrostatic charge of an ionized molecule, i.e. a drug in this example, attracts water, H2O, and results in a relatively water-soluble lipid insoluble complex. The uncharged molecules are absorbed more readily. For example, weak acids, the uncharged HA, can permeate through the lipid membrane, but the anion cannot. For weak bases, same principle. The uncharged molecule can permeate 
but the protonated molecule cannot. So generally speaking, the less charged drugs that we are dealing with, the more predictable the permeability of that molecule and the degree of, absorp of absorption of that molecule actually will be. So where does Henderson-Hasselbalch fit into this concept? Well, the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation is the ratio of the charged to the uncharged molecule. It tells you what proportion of the drug will be in its uncharged state at any given pH. Why is this important? Well, because the pH across the GI tract varies significantly. For example, the pH in the stomach is very low. It's an acidic milieu. The pH in the small intestine is significantly higher. It's a much more basic environment. So we use this concept to predict how and where drugs might be absorbed from the GI tract. There is a very sophisticated calculation that can be, that can be completed for any individual drug. However, at this stage, we don't need you to be able to calculate it. But we do want you to be able to appreciate the concept of how charged molecules can alter the absorption profile for that individual drug and how this can determine where absorption occurs along the GI tract. We can simplify it a little bit further. We can say an easy rule of thumb is that weak acids are absorbed in the stomach more easily and weak bases are absorbed more efficiently in the intestine. There is a clinical consideration that I will mention at this point. If you have patients who are on medications that alter the gastric pH, this may alter how other drugs they are taking may occur. And the best example in clinical medicine are drugs that are used for reflux disorders, such as peptic ulcer disease and gastroesophageal reflux disease. In these patients, they are commonly taking over-the-counter antacids, such as Melanta, or proton pump inhibitors, which is a prescribed medication intentionally given to raise the pH in the stomach. Histamine receptor 2 or H2 blockers such as ranitidine or cimetidine are another example of drugs that are used in peptic ulcer disease or gastroesophageal reflux disease. The primary purpose of antacids, proton pump inhibitors, and H2 blockers is to raise the gastric pH. So keeping this in mind because it might ultimately alter how other drugs are absorbed uh, across the GI tract. To give you an example of the degree of variation of the pH along the GI tract is this slide. So in the stomach, the average pH is very low. It's 1 to 3. In the duodenum and the jejunum, the average pH is 5 to 7. In the ileum, it's even more basic with the average pH being 7 to 8. Special carrier mechanisms, as we've discussed, require that they exist at the site where absorption is going to take place. In this situation, we're talking about across the GI tract. They will ultimately determine what quantity of an administered drug can be absorbed. So carrier mechanisms are what we call saturable. They have a predetermined ability to transfer a predetermined quantity or amount of a given drug. So things to remember about active transport using special carrier mechanisms. They are specific proteins. It is always an energy dependent process. So it requires ATP, which is the energy battery or the energy powerhouse within the body. Importantly, specific carrier mechanisms have the ability to move drugs against a concentration gradient. As said previously, it is saturable. The rate of flow is going to be a function of concentration, much like passive diffusion, until the carrier mechanism is saturated. So it's going to look something like this. This is your fixed principle, aqueous diffusion. As the rate of concentration of the drug increases, 
the rate of flux across the membrane exponentially increases as well. For a carrier-mediated transport, recognizing that it's an active energy requiring mechanism, you see an increase in the rate as a, as a function of the concentration until such time as the carrier-mediated transport becomes saturated. And then this curve flatlines. It remains at a constant level where the carrier-mediated transport capacity is going to be the determining factor of how much drug is actually transported. So we use the uh, concept of bioavailability to measure this process. So what is the definition of bioavailability? It is the fraction of the administered drug that reaches the systemic circulation in an unchanged form. And this, this is a very pure definition. So if I give a drug by mouth, it's how much of that drug that I gave by mouth or that the patient swallowed actually ends up in the circulation in the same form, unchanged. This is an important concept, in an unchanged form in the systemic circulation. For example, if 100 milligrams of a drug is given by mouth, and 70 milligrams is absorbed and delivered to the systemic circulation unchanged, the bioavailability is 70%. How's it calculated? Well, you do, you do the calculation by comparing the plasma level of a drug over time after oral administration, and you compare that to the plasma level of the drug over time after IV administration. Well, a picture is going to be very helpful here. So on the y-axis here, you have plasma concentration of a drug. On the x-axis, you have time. Shown here at the end is administration of a drug. So this line here represents a drug that is given IV. This area here refers to a drug that is given orally. So if a drug is administered at time zero, it's going to reach an immediate peak, shown here on the y-axis, because 100% of the drug is going to reach the circulation. The drug, after it's going to be administered, we're going to talk about this soon, is metabolized. So you will see that over time, the amount of drug in plasma, i.e. plasma concentration, is going to diminish. This shaded area, under the curve refers to the total amount of drug that is in plasma over a duration of time. Not too surprisingly, we refer to this as area under the curve, or AUC. In comparison, in this darker shaded area at the bottom of your slide, shows the, dose, shows the plasma concentration of the drug over time following oral administration. So the bioavailability is the area under the curve following oral administration divided by the area under the curve following IV administration converted into a percent by multiplying by 100. So bioavailability is always represented as a percentage and is always compared to what the area under the curve would be following IV administration, recognizing what we said previously, that bioavailability of a drug administered intravenously is always 100%. So bioavailability is an important concept. What affects it? Well, not too surprisingly, anything that affects absorption is going to affect bioavailability because it's the absorption that, that is going to determine how much drug actually gets to the liver first of all. So the solubility of the drug, the chemical structure of the drug, the existence of a carrier mechanisms, the presence of food in the stomach, the blood supply to the stomach, all those elements that are listed on slide 28. The second thing that is going to affect the bioavailability is how much of the drug is going to be subject to first pass metabolism. So the drug is absorbed, just to remind you again, into the portal circulation from the GI tract and brought to the liver. 
if it's metabolized in the liver, then a smaller amount of the originally administered drug is going to reach the systemic circulation in an unchanged form. So first pass effect reduces the bioavailability. Food in the stomach can reduce the bioavailability. Saturation of a carrier mechanism can reduce the bioavailability. So a complex concept. A lot of things have the potential to reduce bioavailability. And we're back to this slide again. Every step along this way that we have talked about before has the potential to reduce the amount that we administer here that ultimately ends up in circulation. Anything that impacts this process has the potential of reducing bioavailability. So to give you some sort of examples, referring back to the different rights of administration that we talked about earlier are shown in this slide. So to repeat, by definition, a drug administered intravenously has 100% bioavailability. In terms of characteristics, not too surprisingly, it has the most rapid onset of action. A drug administered intramuscularly has a variable bioavailability depending on whether it's aqueous or non-aqueous solution that it's administered in, and it will be somewhere around 75 to 100 percent. We can administer large volumes, however, pain can be a considerable detraction from this method of administration. Subcutaneous, very similar. By mouth, look at that variability in bioavailability. Anything as low as 5 to 100 percent. Now, I'm going to caution you here. We at this point are talking about pharmacokinetics, very much more mathematical principles. We are not talking about pharmacodynamics. So this is not, or I should rephrase this to say, you should not infer that a drug that has a bioavailability, for example, of 5%, intuitively has less efficacy. So don't confuse bioavailability with therapeutic effect or therapeutic or to therapeutic toxicity. So bioavailability purely is a mathematical concept that refers back to the percentage of the drug that was originally administered that ends up in the systemic circulation unchanged. Do not infer a pharmacodynamic consequence of low bioavailability just yet. Per rectum, slightly higher bioavailability in comparison to by mouth, inhalation, and transdermal. So this is a nice reference slide for you just to be able to tie together the concepts that we have talked about. Administration of a drug, absorption of a drug, measurement of that process of absorption using the term bioavailability. So let's see how we're doing. Choose one of the following, A, B, or C. Bioavailability refers to the amount of an administered drug that is available to bring about a desired effect, or the percentage of an administered drug that reaches the circulation in an unchanged form, or the amount of an administered drug plus its active metabolites that reach the systemic circulation. Now I'm hoping that all of you get this one right. It is the percentage of the administered drug that reaches the circulation in the unchanged form. Why are the other two options wrong? First of all, in, num in, in option A, bring about desired effect. I, as I emphasized previously, we are not discussing pharmacodynamics. Bioavailability is purely a pharmacokinetic principle. C is wrong because it includes plus its active metabolites. The whole concept of bioavailability is the percentage of the administered drug that reaches the circulation in an unchanged form. So the correct answer to this question is B.